your fingers. I'm trying, I have them light up. Oh. Stuck. Smells oh, good. That damn near got one. You're already through the board though. Yep. Kind of spindle with that. It's uh, sycamore. Or no, it's willow. Trust the sweet edit. I'll cut a new notch. I'm on like my fifth cord. I'm just trying to... And I haven't even burnt a solid one in yet. So what we need right now is I'm getting, oh I don't know, seven of our straightest kind of thumb size or smaller sticks. It's always the hardest part. Once you get them started, it's much easier from there. So Basically like, all we're doing is like picking a spoke, <laughs> taking it and twisting the uh, vine <clears throat> around each one. And because it's a vine and it's got some stiffness to it, it's going to create a perfect kind of uh, form for us. And then we're going to do this in stages all the way up with the vines that we've got. And then I'll just keep them up. And then uh, once we get our, our vine form in, then we'll take the smaller shoots and jam those in between each one of these. We need to do the next row. So we always use our smallest vines at the bottom of the basket because they have the greatest flexibility. And then we use our larger vines as we go up. And we're a little bit limited. We're a little bit light on material. Here's some of the progress on the fish traps. This one here is a crowdad trap. I'm gonna finish going all the way up it with willow and build a ramp for the crawdads to get stuck in. This one here is our fish trap. Gotten a couple weaves around it and shoved willow shoots up into the sides vertically. And then uh, we will uh, continue to add smaller shoots to close in all the gaps so that the fish can't get out. And then we'll create a smaller funnel to go into the top to be able to secure the fish. Um, over here is our baskets. Here's my little basket coming along nicely. I'm thinking about making a quiver out of it, but not too shabby. And then there's another more of a bowl style basket going over here. This is one Josh started and some of the other guys are working on. So, anyways, Well, it's been raining all afternoon, and so what better thing to do when it's raining than to build baskets? And so uh, this is a really simple process. If you're ever interested in giving it a shot, um, you pretty much just need an odd number of spokes, lay them flat, and then begin to weave the base of it, and then just slowly begin to form it in the shape that you want. And uh, you can slowly but surely get you a nice basket. Here I thought about going with the quiver, but I ended up converting it to a basket, so it's kind of an egg-shaped bottom, which isn't great for setting, but I can make some uh, loops here with these top branches that are still sticking up and make some handles for making a berry basket. So anyways, um, pretty happy with how she turned out. Um, I've messed with some basketry a little bit, but nothing real extensive, so especially not with 100% primitive uh, material. So, anyways, well, guys, this wraps up uh, basketry, and uh, be sure to give it a shot. A lot of people take their knives and they'll go straight in and do their cuts this way. And that's why they can't get through most of their deer um, without sharpening it um, before they get through it. And so I go at a 45 and that helps me just stay on the skin. 
Now, once you cut past the first layer of epidermis, you'll see that little wiggle wound. Uh, if everybody can kind of come over here and take a look at this, you can wiggle your finger just under it, and so you know you've gone deep enough. So go ahead and take a look at that. You can pinch it up, and if it's got a clear space under it, you know you've gone past the, the last layer of the epidermis. Um, these, well, I want to wait because I'm really here. to get He's, He's here. here? He's here. Okay, cool. Let's go back. All right. So I start off with my deer um, by starting at the second joint. I don't start at the top. It's just too much, too much extra effort, and I use this bone anyway for other stuff as well as the hubs, and I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, so I start here, and I just work my way around, and then I lift the deer up, and I find that line where the hair changes pattern. And a lot of people have the common misconception of just going where the hair changes color, but it doesn't always change color in the same spot, and it doesn't always change color where that hair pattern changes. So I find out where that hair pattern changes, and that's where I'm going to draw my line to. And if you follow it, it usually goes right towards the buttocks. <clears throat> Um, and so I follow that all the way up, and once you get that part done, you can start removing the genitals. And when you remove the genitals, it gives you a clear opening to going ahead and cutting that, that, ca that gut cavity and working that. And I'll show you that as we progress along. Um, so does anybody here know what these are? Tarsal glands. There you go. Sweet. What, what can you use those for? Any Tracking guesses? more deer. <laughs> Tracking more deer, that's right. I call sacred geometry, your body. It's your way of measuring things and controlling things and manipulating things to make your life a little bit easier versus um, getting hasty and then bending over and hunching over consistently because it's going to make your life a living hell over time. And you're going to get a lot of injuries that way. And so I just kind of hold it up with my knee. And I might start thumb rolling that back or knuckle rolling it. And I'll just use this blade to give me enough movement. So I want everybody to come close right now. And look right here. Do you see this kind of filmy fascia right here? Silver skin, isn't it? Huh? Silver skin? You call it silver skin. Um, all it is, it's just, it's the, this skin, you ever see a horse and you see its skin jump and move? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it's like knocking flies off of it, but it doesn't even have to reach back or anything. Its skin just jumps. That's what this does. You really want to make sure that you're using just the tip of your blade starting out. You shouldn't have to extend past that at all. Um, and when you're using a stone, I like to use one side until it is completely dull, and then I'll flip it over and I've got another blade. You don't have to keep switching over and over. So just take a little piece and dedicate that to the work at hand. And well, preserve using, it as much as possible. When you're using stone, everybody imagines this big giant knife that you're going to be using. For real, you're using small flakes. And they're sharp as hell. Yeah, like this guy right here. That's what we're using. All right, so we got half of his back hind quarters taken off. Um, we followed. The, this is called a money cut, by the way. That you're going to get the most money for this cut by following that line if you're selling hides. But do the same thing to the other side, guys. That's what we don't want, the sun. I swear, I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to sound like a jerk, but I'm like, I guarantee that's, right. that's why he's doing I'll be a jerk for everybody. Exactly, go for it, use me, please. There's some more girls over here. I have a feeling eventually I'll get my wife at least to do a basic course. I almost had her this time. Just as long as Bob and Uncle be there? Smoke. There we go. You're walking to it if you want to. Or any more green leaf. Like a tree worth. Perfect example. Like, come feel my finger. When we process out a deer, it's vital that we use every part as much as we can. Everything from the tendons to the ligaments to the bones, even to every part of the meat from using the vital organs and making things such as stews, steak planks and drying out the meats for further use. So you just want to lay this so that you're kind of following the grain so everybody can come see what I mean by following the grain. The hair grows back that direction, you're going to be scraping that direction, okay? 
And this is called a wet scrape. So there's many different ways to tan hides, but this is a wet scrape method. And I'm going to take you guys through a dry scrape when we start graining the, the fur side later on after we string it up. But just like we took the skin off, you're going to take the hair off the same way. A couple notes on the hide processing. Um, we're soaking the hide in a lye solution, which is made up of ash. And pretty much you're taking hardwood ash, not softwood, a hardwood ash. And you're, you're using quite a bit in a five gallon bucket. And they're using shovelfuls. And we uh, put that to a solution that's almost thick and soupy. And then it wants, you want it to be buoyant enough to cause an egg to float. The egg's still slinky, sinking, there's not enough lye in it. So we got to make sure it floats. Um, if you don't have an egg, per se, in the wild, um, they say you can use coal, like a big old piece of coal, and it, it'll it naturally want to float, and it'll do the opposite. You, when you push it down, it'll stay down. It won't come all the way up because the soupy solution will absorb and, and weigh it down. Um, and that's the way you can tell if the consistency of the lye solution is strong enough. Um, also for brain tanning or tanning the hide you can use pit, the, the brain of the animal um, if you don't want to process the brain of the animal you can use pig brains and you're wanting a strong thick solution as well again they say that you can that every animal has enough brains to tan its own hide but it's always good to add a couple eggs if you're doing it at home to give it that extra uh, thicker solution brain tan solution and uh, so those are some few tips that I may have missed. In the bottom section down there too? Yeah. Actually, we should have used this one. This is already a partial. Yeah. Not much can of hide. Do you even smell that smell anymore? Barely. So you do it, you build it backwards. At least that's how I prefer it. That way you can just wrap around it when you're ready. next phase. Sure, at least all the seed. You just so use your hands to compress it into shape. Now traditionally you would just use the cedar bark, wrap it with cedar, um, cedar fluff, and wrap it with cedar, right? It makes something a little better. So it serves two purposes. You can use it for light. You just blow it into flame and get it hot and then you can use it like that. You can make these as big or as small as you like. And what's the other purpose? To, I'm sorry, to uh, act as a bug deterrent. You can like smudge out your... Yep, smudge out your area. People wonder how they smudge out areas that they can't set stuff inside of, like your uh, debris beds. I you can use that. that. Okay. Make a smudge stick. It can almost be used for signaling too. It's probably going to put off quite a bit of smoke in it. Mm -hmm. It keeps the bugs out and the evil spirits away. You have to get some sage grass for that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that you'd want to do any less green, as good as it's burning I, you now. You know what I would change? What? Is I would put the green further away from the tinder bundle. I tried it different this time, thinking it might be more intelligent to do it that way. 
But it seems to be working good. It just took a while to catch. Yeah, it's definitely working well now. I'd be a little nervous about having less green, especially with the straw on the outside. Yeah, especially that sucker would be glowing nice at dark. Yeah, for sure. You get some light from it. They're always panicking. Even when you make them with just cedar, they still don't spark up as well. Does anybody want this? Hey guys, Justin Williams here, Dirt Time Adventures. It is day 27 and uh, pretty much wrapping up four weeks. Picked a, uh, even though my beautiful bride can't be here, picked this beautiful bouquet of flowers. By thinking of her, it's got some primrose in it and some Indian paintbrush. Gonna post a picture and send it to her. Let her know that I'm thinking of her. But yeah, day uh, day 27. It's it's been quite the uh, quite the adventure. Four weeks in, three weeks left, and I just don't want it to end. I think that's the the hardest part is I'm discouraged about it being over uh, faster than it started. But uh, you know, I learned a lot this week. We did some some animal skinning with uh, stone, stone tools, and did some some buckskin processing, and made some baskets, I think was this week. <laughs> it was a crazy week, we did all kinds of stuff. We made arrows, um, finished my crossbow this week. Just a phenomenal week. And I don't know, I just don't want it to end. After a while, you just you run out of things to say because you're just so overwhelmed with everything you're experiencing. I uh, I don't know. My greatest fear is not um, seer week or scout week or anything that this course can throw at me. My greatest fear is what I'm going to do when I get back home. That uncertainty. And I should look at that uncertainty as an adventure instead of as a fear. But, you know, if you're like me, kind of a control freak, you like to know what the next stage is. And I don't. But I know right here in the here and the now, I get to embrace this. And... I need to cherish the four weeks that I've had and the three weeks that I got coming and cherish it while it lasts. Um, I miss my wife and kids, but, you know, at the same time, I don't want to go home. I want them to come here and, and live off the land and provide for yourselves. And, and some of it's a pipe dream that we make it real romantic but other than the really 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 hard work it really is very rewarding and very beautiful and very serene I'm gonna miss this view I can tell you that so four weeks in three weeks to go Loving it. Loving every minute of it.